corn producing the seed and so on. So now, the karma along with intention has to, mere intention is not enough. It has to have root causes for the intention to have potency. They are known as mula. You see, kamma mula. There are basically these are, these mulas give kamma an ethical quality, a moral quality. That simply means that a kamma is either good or bad. Ethics and morality deals with what is basically good or basically bad. Now, in a theistic concept, uh, context of uh, karma, where the karma is considered a fate or that is a reward or a punishment from a creator, the creator is responsible for uh, rewarding or punishing, etc. So now, this fatalism associated with the, uh, with the karma, it has no such thing as root or cause or ethical quality at all. It is determined by uh, whoever is the, uh, whether you call it creator or whatever, is determined whether a person should be punished or rewarded. So the question of an autonomous law and all that, all that does not, doesn't come at all. It's, it is the whim of the Almighty or his Whatever he wants, he does this. So this kind of thing is totally absent or alien and is rejected outright in Buddhism. So here, the action becomes, has an ethical quality by its own force. A thing is not good because somebody has said it is good, or a book says, or religion says, or a guru says, no. It is good because it is rooted in good factors, mental factors. It is bad because it is rooted in unwholesome psychological factors, mental factors. So a karma, the ethical quality of karma, a karma is either good or bad, or kamma is either good or bad. So it's called kusala kamma or akusala kamma. So a kusala kamma, a wholesome action or morally wholesome action is wholesome morally because it is rooted in morally wholesome roots. So the karmic roots, whether bad or good, akusala kamma is akusala or bad or unwholesome because it is rooted in lobha, dosa, moha in greed or hatred or delusion or ignorance. Now, these roots, ultimately psychological roots, are motivations. Now, for instance, when a person is motivated by greed, and that greed has come because it is very much connected with ignorance of the result of that greed, if a person knows that, well, I am greedy or I am um, corrupt, I want to make money, easy money, and he knows the consequence will be jail or whatever, bad name or whatever, then he will not do that. So along with greed, delusion or ignorance is inevitable. They go together. So similarly, an angry man, if he knows the consequence, that suffering now and suffering later. If he knows that, he will never be angry. So it is the ignorance, avijja or anjana, agyan. It is that which is at the, uh, at the base of both greed and hate. So a karma motivated by greed, hatred and delusion, or ignorance, is, gives the karma its ethical quality. And this ethical quality determines the destiny. If 
The karma is bad. It simply means you will be born in a painful state of uh, existence. All bad karmas produce result in the apaya, in the lower subhuman planes of existence. By committing a bad karma or evil unwholesome karma motivated by greed or hatred and delusion and so on, one is bound to be born. One's future rebirth will be in the lower planes, in the planes of woe, like animal, ghost, or a demoniac being, or in the hellish worlds, the hells. So that is the logic. It's as plain as that. Because the motivating factors are destructive, evil, unwholesome, they produce result in a plane of existence which is filled with suffering and filled with ignorance, filled with uh, greed. Now an animal instinctively uh, commits all kinds of evil. A tiger has just eaten a big animal, but he sees a smaller one and it pounces on it with all that greed and hate and that delusion. So this is the logic behind it. Ethical quality with the karma is given by this psychological factor. Similarly, the good karma, it is good because it is motivated by non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. Now, when we use the word non, it's not negation of anything, no. It is that which is capable of uh, doing away with greed. So, you know, non-greed does not mean absence of greed, but it means the presence of a powerful factor like generosity, giving, dana, that does away with greed, negates the greed. So when the mind is motivated and is rooted in this uh, non-greed, non-hatred and non-delusion, the ethical quality of that mind is wholesome. And the result it produces is either in the sugati. Sugati means the happy planes of existence, like human plane, human plane or the devas in the various kama loka, deva lokas, or the brahma loka where life is filled with joy and happiness and bliss. And it, it lasts very, very long indeed. So, the result, the, uh, the ability to produce a result in the form of a destiny, that potency is inherent in two factors, mental factors. One in the form of will, and the other in the form of motivations, greed, hatred, delusion, or non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion. And they are all mental factors. So the importance of karma, if you have to understand karma, then you must understand its importance comes because it is preceded, it is forerun by mind, it is generated by mind, it is uh, wrought or created by the mind. Mind is the chief. Mano setha mano maya. Manasa se pasarnena or padutthena. If with a solid mind, with a dirty mind, polluted mind, a person does or says something, misery follows him just like the hoof of the drought animal, the, uh, the bullock that pulls the cart. The wheel of the cart follows behind the bull. It is inevitable. The bullock is, uh, you see, is all the time dogged by that wheel. Similarly, a good karma, a karma done with a good intention, with a good mind, with a good motivation, you see, uh, produces uh, anything done or said by such a motivation or such an intention will produce good results, just as 
chaya va anapayini. Just as one's own shadow, you see, leave and follows one, wherever one goes. Non-departing, it cannot depart. So long one moves, the shadow also will. So happiness follows him, wherever him or her, by the logic of its own, uh, you see, the ethical quality. So one has to very clearly understand that karma is very different from the word karma, which means fatalism and all that. And karma means a pure law, a psychological law, and is motivated by uh, wholesome or unwholesome psychological factors. And it is intentional. I have given two examples, if you please keep it in your mind. The example of that princess, intentional and non-intentional. And the example of a tree. I will further uh, <clears throat> dilate on this tree. This tree analogy is very, very apt indeed. First of all, the kamma must have root causes, just as the tree must have roots. Kamma, as a seed, so to say, it has got the potency to produce a result in the form of a tree. And when that seed sprouts, it sprouts into these roots. And it is then solidly established on the ground, then there is what you call the process of growth. The seed, not only the tree rather, not only has root, but it bears fruit. So that process, the whole thing is involved in process. Now the growth is a process, and when it bears a fruit, that also is in a process of ripening. And when it is fully ripened, then it becomes a seed. And that seed again has the same potency as the tree has. The potency of the tree is in its capacity, capacity to produce a result, a fruit, and the fruit into a seed. So this regenerative process involved in the seed on the tree is very, very, uh, you see, it's a very good illustration of life itself. The regenerative capacity of a man or a woman comes from this karma. So a man or a woman together produces a man or a woman, not an animal. Similarly, an animal or the tree and all that sort of thing. So this reproductive capacity in a human being, their whole lies in this karmic process. And that is where one has to understand the importance of karma. So people talk all kinds of things not knowing that this talk is a karma. And it has a capacity to produce a result which can be very severe. It can be a regenerative. It can decide one's, one's destiny in the future. Just this speech or a thought. So in the next discourse, we will discuss about the three types of karmas. How, which one is more important? Which one is more potent? and why it is so. So today I have discussed, uh, you see, part of this series on karma or kamma, namely the example of the intentional aspect of karma, then the volitional, that rather voli uh, intentional volition, and the other, the root causes, the roots, the motivation and how all these together, you see, manifest in the form of either uh, mental action, thinking, or verbal action, speech, or bodily action, you see, any deed. So these three, threefold 
forms of karma, they are the manifestation rather of the mental, this entire very complex mental working of volitional activity. Volitional and this uh, coupled with the motivational factors, how they work in a way uh, to produce these threefold karmas and how these threefold karmas ultimately decide fate, ultimately decide our destiny, not fate. That must be understood. Once you know this and understand, then you know yourself. And when you know yourself, then you have the capacity to control yourself. And the controlling means what? Controlling one's actions. You are able to restrain your action, the way you speak, the way you think, the way you do. So the self-control comes from self-knowledge, knowing oneself. And self-knowledge does not mean knowing a certain self, an entirely different entity called Atma or self or soul. No. Here it simply means knowing oneself, one's activities. one's actions. So having the capacity to self-control oneself, one purifies oneself, one improves one's, one's uh, life process. And by improving it, ultimately one transforms and that is enlightened. We will discuss further on this. Today this much we have discussed. May the grace of Bhagavan Buddha Surround your lives with wisdom and well-being. May you all be happy. Sukhino bhavantu.